Okay, so especially for those of you who have been watching my channel for some time, and if you've seen my live option trading videos, then I'm sure you've noticed that for the past couple months or so, I've been exclusively trading in a paper money account. Now, why is that? Well, the answer is simply that over the past five months, August through December, I have been testing out a new option trading strategy that I have been developing over the course of 2021. And so my intention was to test out this strategy for about five to six months in the real markets, but of course using fake money. So that way I can make mistakes and tweak some things without losing real money, of course. And I'm definitely pleased with the results so far after these past five months. So I don't see a need to go on to a sixth month. I'm just going to stop here and come next week. I'm going to spin back up my live money account and I'll be trading the strategy for real. And so this video here is gonna give you a very in-depth look at exactly what happened over the past five months while I was testing things out. So I'm gonna show you exactly how much money I made, where things went correctly, where things went wrong, and all the learning lessons that were involved with that. And then also I'll show you the very detailed metrics and statistics that I was tracking along the way. Now, for those of you who are new to the channel or if you simply need a refresher on what my strategy is, I'll explain it briefly here. So I am exclusively an option seller and specifically, I only sell naked options. So that means pretty much the only three strategies I use are selling naked put options, selling naked call options, or selling both at the same time, which would be a short strangle. And most of the time, the options I sell stay out of the money. They remain pretty much untouched and therefore they simply decay in value over time. And at some point down the road, I'll buy the contracts back for a much lower price than where I sold them and I'll make the difference as a nice profit. Now, of course, there are still always times where the stock actually does breach the strike of one of the options I sell. And especially if when you sell naked options, you do have theoretically infinite loss potential when that happens. If the stock keeps on going after that point, your losses are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that is where my custom approach to selling options comes into play. So in those kinds of situations, I will actually buy or short the stock to cover the contracts that go in the money. So for example, let's say I have a stock that's currently trading at 50 bucks per share. And let's also say I'm bearish on the stock for some reason. So therefore I sell an out of the money call option at a strike of 55. Now, as long as the stock stays below 55, there's nothing I need to do with the trade because as the option remains out of the money, it will slowly deteriorate in value over time. And that's exactly what I want as an option seller. But now let's say I'm totally dead wrong directionally on the trade and the stock starts to skyrocket and it blows through my strike of 55. At that point, once the stock breaches my strike, I will buy 100 shares of the stock. And therefore, I will have converted my initially naked call option into a covered call option. And as a result of doing that, it does not matter how much higher the stock goes after that point because the stock I purchased totally covers my obligations on the contract if I do get assigned on it. So now let's say we fast forward to expiration and the stock ends up at 65 bucks per share, $10 above my strike price. So as a result, I'm gonna get assigned on the call option. And when that happens, as a seller of the call, I have to sell 100 shares of the stock at my strike price at 55 bucks per share. But of course, if that was the same price that I bought those shares at the beginning, once it breached my strike price, then nothing happens to me with the assignment process. I bought the shares at 55 and then I sold the shares at 55 nothing happens, but I still keep the premium that I sold the call option for at the very, very beginning. So that in a very simplified nutshell is my custom approach to options trading. I simply sell naked options initially, and then I will use the underlying stock to convert those options into covered options if they ever go in the money. Okay. So at this point, we're now ready to take a look at the final outcome of the past five month testing period. But one last little thing before I do so, in case you are actually brand new to the channel, I do also want to let you know that you can find me on Skillshare as well, where you can take my very in-depth classes on options trading or stock market investing. And I provided some links to some of the introductory courses of mine in the description of this video below. So be sure to check them out. And when you sign up for Skillshare using any of those links, you'll get a full one month free trial. All right. So now starting off first with the very high level results. After my five month testing period, my paper money account is up by 11.26%. And so back on August 1st, when I began this testing period, my starting capital was $50,000. So an 11.26% return in five months is equal to a total profit of $5,631.60. And then if you take that return and you project it out over 12 full months, that would come out to be an over 27% return in one year. So that handily beats the average market return of about 8 to 10% annually, 
and that's also right around my target. Typically, I want to generate at least a 25% return in one year, so projecting to be a little bit above that is certainly good news. And then finally, the main thing I'm looking for with this strategy, which is pretty much the reason why I've been developing it in the first place, is I want my returns to be pretty uncorrelated to the general market. So because I can convert any option I sell into a covered option if I need to, that allows me to make money in literally any market environment. Stocks can go up, stocks can go sideways, and stocks can even go down, and it does not matter. This strategy still has the ability to make money when stocks are moving in any direction. And as you will see also later in this video, I did make many of mistakes and have a lot of learning lessons along the way over these past five months. And that was the whole point of doing this testing period anyway. So hopefully that means going forward, and assuming I don't repeat these mistakes again, of course, I do expect my performance to get better and better and better. And so that covers the very high level results. And so now we're gonna jump over to my computer here and we're gonna dive into all the nitty gritty details. Okay, so what you're seeing here is my monthly trade tracking spreadsheet. And this one in particular is for the month of December, which you can see right there. So this was the last month of my five month testing period. And so of course these sheets that I put together every single month contain all the trades that I made for that month. And then down below, a lot of important statistics and metrics about the entire month. And so as you can see right here at the top, at the top of my portfolio stats table here, at the beginning of December, I had 54,135 bucks in my account, in my paper trading account that is. And by the end of the month, I had 55,631. So of course, because I began this entire testing period back in August with a starting capital of $50,000, that means once again, over these five months, I made a total of about 5,600 bucks, which you can also see reflected again down here in this row. Total P&L, $5,631. Now, before I go over the rest of these stats here, I do want to briefly run through each individual month and show you how much money I made in each month. And in that way, you can see the kinds of fluctuations I went through to make this $5,600. So now if I come up here and go to my August spreadsheet, let's click on that. And as you can see down here, I already have the same table pulled up in that spreadsheet. And so, as I said, I started this entire five month testing period with a beginning account balance of exactly $50,000. And this month of August was by far my best month. Right, as you can see in this zone here, these are all the stats for that particular month of August. And in that one month, I made 3,460 bucks. And the reason being, if you come back up here and take a look at all the trades I made during the month of August, all the trades that are highlighted in green, those were all the trades where I made money. And all the ones in black, those trades were still ongoing beyond the month of August. So that means for this one here in my win trade, where I sold a short strangle at the 115 strike call and the 92 and a half strike put option, this trade I entered on August 10th, but I did not take it off either for a profit or a loss until the month of September. So the outcome of this trade would be reflected in my September spreadsheet. But of course, as you can see here, there was not a single trade that I had in the month of August where I actually lost money. Otherwise, you would see some trades here highlighted in red. So that was great. And then what about September now? Let's come back up here and go to my September spreadsheet. And for this month, I did make substantially less money. For September, the final outcome was a profit still of only 505 bucks. So still made money, still made about a 1% return and can't complain too much about that. But coming back up to my trades now for this month, as you can see in particular with my Bed Bath & Beyond short strangle, this was, I believe, an earnings trade. And this one trade set me back really, really far. So right here in this box, this was the final P&L of that particular trade. And as you can see, I lost $579. And the many issues I faced with earnings trades over this testing cycle was one of the lessons that I learned as I'll talk about later in this video, but this was actually one of the main things that caused me to not do as well as I hoped to. As you'll see, especially in the months of October and November, I had a lot of earnings trades that went really, really badly. But again, I still did walk away with a profit for this month and can't complain too much. Now let's go to October. And this month was actually even worse. For October, I only made about $108, still a profit, but obviously not much at all. And like I said, one of the main issues I was facing is some really nasty, bad earnings trades. So now, as you can see in October, I had three losing trades, one in JD, one in Alibaba, and one in Snapchat. And Snapchat here, this was another earnings trade that went super, super badly. I believe for this trade, let's find out, let's come all the way to the right. Yep, for this trade, I lost $573. Whereas with Alibaba and JD, these were not earnings trades, they were simply regular trades. 
And in the case of JD, I lost only $36. And for Alibaba, I lost only 135. So again, earnings trades, as I'll discuss later in this video, those were a significant issue for me over these five months. And then finally, what about November? Let's take a look at my portfolio stats for that month. And once again, this month was even worse than October. I only made about $61 for the month of November. And of course, earnings trades were a significant portion of that, but also some other trades that went really wrong for different reasons. Also, I'll discuss in the later section of this video. So as you can see here, I lost money in EWZ, Snapchat, Peloton, GDXJ, Peloton again, et cetera, et cetera. And this month in particular was definitely filled with a lot of learning lessons. But I do also want to emphasize here that even having made a lot of mistakes, particularly in this month of November, still walking away with some profit, even if it was only $61, is still nothing to complain about that much, right? Oftentimes when you make big mistakes in the stock market, you end up losing money in the end. And then finally, again, coming back to December here, after I made those mistakes and learned from them and made some corrections to my trading strategy as a result, that's why in this month, I was back to actually making some decent money. So for the final month here of my testing period, I made about $1,500, which was about a 2.76% return just in that one month. So therefore, when you add all that up, that's what equals the 5,600 bucks I made over the entire five months. And also one thing to note here, I know this column says this year, and also this one over here says lifetime. As you can tell, the stats for both of these columns here are exactly the same because again, all these spreadsheets here, all these calculations only encapsulate the past five months of testing. So that means when I switch back to real money and I continue further beyond just five months, at that point, these two columns will have much more significance. So right now, just for this testing period, this year just simply means the past five months, August through December, and same thing with lifetime. And so now briefly going over these other few metrics here, as you can see over these past five months, I made a total of exactly 64 trades. And those trades were spread out over multiple different kinds of option trading strategies. Some were short strangles, actually most were short strangles, naked puts, naked calls. I think I maybe had one or two debit spreads in there, but in total over the past five months, I made 64 trades. And of those trades, 50 of them I actually made money on, which means only 14 I actually lost money on. So therefore, when you calculate my overall win rate, that comes out to be just shy of 80%. So almost 80% of the trades I made ended up with a profit. That's pretty darn good. And that's a real testament to how powerful selling options can be. You have the ability to create trades that give you very high chances of turning a profit. And this is not something you can find in stock trading or with option buying strategies. So again, I'm very pleased with about an 80% win rate. And then these next three rows are simply a breakdown of my overall P&L for those five months. In particular, amongst all my winning trades, my total profit was about $13,000. And then adding up all my losing trades, I lost about $7,000. So taking the combined result, that still leaves an overall profit of $5,600. And then finally, these last three are pretty interesting, I think. So amongst my winning trades, my average profit was $257. Of course, some trades had much smaller profits, other trades had much bigger, but on average, it was about 250 bucks. And then amongst my losing trades, the average loss was about $517, basically about twice my average profit, which intuitively might seem like a bad thing, but you have to factor in my win rate. When you do have a very high win rate, you can afford to lose more money on average amongst your losing trades compared to your winning trades. And that's why my expected P&L per trade is a positive number of about 90 bucks. And this number is very, very important because it means on average, as I continue making trades and continue using my exact trading methodology, that means my expected average outcome per trade is a profit of about 88 to $90. So that takes into account my occasional losers. You definitely can't avoid losses from time to time, but still on average, as I continue making trades, then over time, my account will still be steadily growing. And the reason why this number is so important is because it gives you a very clear picture with one number, how effective your trading strategy is. If this number was negative, then on average, you should be expecting to lose money. And that's not a good thing, right? So the goal with any trading strategy is to get this number to be, of course, positive, but also as large as possible. And so that covers my trading performance over this entire five month testing period. And even after making some pretty nasty mistakes, I'm still pretty pleased with the final outcome. Because as long as I learn from those mistakes and I do not repeat them in the future, I do expect over time my performance to get better and better and better, which of course will be reflected by this particular number. 
Now, finally, in this video, what exactly were all the lessons that I learned over the past five months here? Well, the first one is to stay away from low IV or low implied volatility stocks or ETFs. So for example, if we come over here now to Thinkorswim, one of my most problematic trades that I made over the past five months was an EWZ. So this is an ETF which tracks the Brazilian equity markets. And even though amongst ETFs, it's still pretty volatile, but in general, it's still a very low IV product. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with implied volatility, let's come down here. And this chart shows you the implied volatility for EWZ over the past one year. And so there are a few ways you can interpret implied volatility. And one such way is the expected future price range for this particular ETF. So right now the IV for EWZ is 35.45%. And by default, when you look up the implied volatility for any stock in your platform, the default time horizon in the future is one year. So one year from today, the market is pricing in an expected move of EWZ of up or down by 35.45%. So again, this number gives you an expected price range at some point in the future. And so moving up or down by about 35% in one year might sound like a lot, but how does that translate to a day-to-day -day basis? Because in reality, moving 35% over one full year, 12 months, is actually not that much. So that means on a day-to-day -day basis, the fluctuations for this particular ETF are not that great. So especially as you can see in here as one example, for many, many days in a row, EWZ was fluctuating right around 29 to 30 bucks per share. It was basically moving nowhere. Now, why exactly is this a problem though? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason has to do with my particular trading strategy. Specifically, when I sell options, as I explained earlier, if one of those options goes in the money, I will either buy or short the underlying stock to cover those contracts. So in the case here, let's say I sold the 29 strike put option, which would be right around here or so, then that means every time EWZ falls below 29, I would have to short 100 shares of the ETF. And then of course, should the stock reverse and go back above 29, I'll have to buy those shares back for a small loss. So of course, if that happens many, many times, I'm gonna start losing a lot of money. Those small losses will start to add up. And so in the case here with a stock or an ETF that does not move very much on a day-to-day -day basis, if the product you're trading has very low implied volatility, then you might find yourself in a situation where the stock or ETF is indeed bouncing through your strikes many, 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 many times and just not moving anywhere. And like I said, with this particular ETF, that definitely happened and I did lose a lot of money on one of these trades. Moreover, when it comes time to make adjustments on your positions, and this is not just applicable to my own trading strategy, but oftentimes when you make an adjustment to a short naked put option, what you might wanna consider is selling an out of the money call option because that allows you to take in extra credit. And this is where the second issue with trading low IV products comes into play. And that is you cannot even take in much additional premium when you do make those adjustments. And that's because imply volatility down here, this concept is baked into the prices of option contracts. Specifically as imply volatility expands, the greater the IV, the greater the option prices. And then conversely, as implied volatility contracts, again, so do the prices of options, they come down. And so with an IV of only about 35%, the options on EWZ are typically never that expensive. And that's why when I got caught in situations just like this, where EWZ was simply not moving, I could not even make adjustments by selling call options that would even compensate me for those losses by that much. And that's why in particular for one of these trades I made on EWZ back in November, let's come back to the spreadsheets real quick here and go to my November sheet. If we come back up here and find that EWZ position, which was right there, this one started out as simply a naked put option at the 30 strike. And even after making all the adjustments I possibly could on this one position, coming all the way now to the realized P&L column here, the final outcome of that trade was still a loss of almost $1,200. And again, that's mostly because EWZ was simply not moving at all. And it kept bouncing through my strikes so many freaking times. And so that's why in the month of December, I only traded stocks with an implied volatility above 50%. 50 was the absolute minimum I would trade. And I definitely did notice a big difference in my trades for that month because there was only one trade in GameStop in particular. And I'll talk more about that later where the stock did bounce through my strikes quite a bit and I did end up losing money but that was mostly for a different reason that I'll talk about in a second here as well. So again, first major learning lesson was to only trade stocks with a very high implied volatility, at least 50%.
and I do mean 50% minimum most of the time. Of course, sometimes IV can spike, as you can see here, but I'm saying only trade stocks where most of the time, on average, the IV is still above 50% or so. Not like EWZ here, where most of the time the IV is around 30%. Next up, the second major lesson I learned was to preferably trade higher price stocks over lower price stocks. And there are two reasons for that as well. The first of which is higher price stocks allow you to have on fewer positions and also fewer contracts per position. So it makes everything easier to manage, right? This particular trading strategy that I'm using where I'm buying and selling stock, once my contracts go in the money, et cetera, it can be very difficult to manage all your positions if you have a lot of them because oftentimes you might have multiple positions that require stock hedging at the same time. Now, of course, I do try to automate the buying and selling of stock to hedge my positions, but once the automated orders I have in place run out, once they're extinguished, basically, I have to create new ones. And again, if I have multiple positions on that are ripping through those hedging orders very quickly, it's very difficult to keep up and make new orders and keep everything going correctly. So that's why I've learned to size up a little bit my individual position sizing. And in that way, I can manage in total about five to seven positions at one time. Once you get beyond that point, it becomes very difficult to manage everything together. And the second reason why I prefer to trade higher price stocks, let's look at NVIDIA, for example, NVDA, has to do with the fact that simply because these stocks are higher priced, they do move a lot more. Right, a stock like Nvidia here, which is priced currently at about 300 bucks per share, you will almost never see the stock moving by only one dollar a day or by 50 cents. But of course, the strikes that you're selling options at, they're always one particular number. So, therefore, what I've found with these higher price stocks is if they do breach your strikes and you do have to buy or short the stock, they tend to breach your strikes and then keep on moving. They don't stick around one particular price very often and just bounce around that one number many, many days in a row, right? For example, if Nvidia here was to move by just 2% in one day, that would be a move of about $6. So again, the chance that if Nvidia crosses through one of your strikes, the chance that it keeps on moving beyond that point is pretty decent. It might bounce through your strikes a few times, but again, in my experience, these stocks do tend to move by a decent amount every day because they're so high priced. Whereas compared to EWZ again, let's go back to that chart. This ETF is only about 30 bucks per share. So a 2% move for this ETF would equate to only about 60 cents. And if your strike is caught in the middle of that, there's a pretty decent chance that EWZ could bounce through that strike many, many times. So once more, learning lesson number two is to preferably trade higher price stocks first. Obviously, you also have to keep in mind your trading account size as well. Right, for example, even with $50,000, I can't trade Amazon. That's a $3,000 stock. But I do now try and allocate about 5% of my account capital for each trade that I'm making. Whereas previously, I was only allocating about 1% to 2%. So therefore, because I'm willing to risk more capital per trade, that's what allows me to trade larger price stocks. Right, Selling puts on NVIDIA, for example, is going to require a lot more capital than selling puts on EWZ. Next up, learning lesson number three is to only trade highly liquid and easy to borrow stocks. And this one in particular, I learned with GameStop this past month in December. So if we come back to my spreadsheets real quick here and go back to my December sheet, and let's go ahead and find my GameStop short strangle, this one right there. So for this trade, I sold the 190 strike call option and the 145 strike put option. But unfortunately, if we come all the way to the right and take a look at the final outcome of this one trade, as you can see here, I lost over $800. Now, why did this happen? Well, in a similar fashion with EWZ, this stock did bounce through my put strike many, many, many times. Now, of course, also with this trade, because of that, I did make adjustments by rolling down my call option and taking an extra credit. And of course, because GameStop is a very high implied volatility stock, the additional premium I was taking in was pretty nice, but I still ended up losing a lot of money. And that was mostly because GameStop is not a very liquid stock. In particular, if we come back to Thinkorswim again, and we'll go to GameStop, GME, you can see right here with a bid and ask spread. The bid price for GameStop as of the market close is $147.20, and the asking price is $148. There's an 80 cent difference between these two numbers, and that is actually a lot. So when I talk about good liquidity, I'm talking about very tight bid ask spreads. Now, of course, what you will find is higher price stocks do tend to have wider bid ask spreads in general, even if the stock is traded millions of times per day. 
But even if we come to a stock like NVIDIA, which is over $300, right? Take a look at the bid and ask spread here. The difference is only seven cents. So NVIDIA is a very, very heavily traded stock. And in fact, if we come to the trade tab here, we can take a look at the actual volume this past day. So there we go. NVIDIA was traded over 40 million times. Whereas compared to GameStop, let's check that out, GME, compared to only 1.6 million shares traded today. So basically the greater number of shares that are traded in one day, the tighter and tighter and tighter the bid and ask spread will be. And if you're pursuing my kind of strategy where I'm buying or shorting actual shares of the stock, then good liquidity is absolutely important because that's going to translate to very good fill prices, right? In the case of my 145 strike put option, let's go to the charts real quick here and zoom in. My put option was right around here or so. So it was mostly during these couple of days where GME was bouncing through that put strike many times. And I set my hedging orders to short and buy back the stock if need be, such that I would expect to lose about 30 bucks every time that happened. That's at least how I set the pricing on those orders. But once again, because GameStop is not very liquid, the actual fill prices on those orders were terrible, right? For example, I might set my short sell order to short the stock if GameStop falls down to a price of, let's say, $144.70 or so, right around there. But most of the time when that did happen, I would not get filled at $144.70. I would actually get filled at a price of maybe $144.20. And then same thing, to buy those shares back, I would set my order to buy those shares if GameStop bounced back up to a price of 145 again. But same thing, the actual fill price might be 145.50. So instead of losing maybe 30 bucks like I would expect to, I would actually lose over $100 in some cases, or 60 bucks in most of the cases. So even though GameStop did bounce through my strike, my put strike, many, many times, the main reason why I did lose so much money on this trade, over 800 bucks, was because my fill prices were so, so terrible. If I actually got filled around the prices I wanted to, this loss would have been probably about $300, not $800. So that's in regards to liquidity. And then also in regards to this learning lesson, only trade stocks that are easy to borrow. And that's because when you do sell put options and if the stock falls below your strike and you have to short the stock, you actually have to borrow the stock when you short sell it. That's how shorting works. You first borrow the stock from your broker, then you sell it in the market immediately. And then at some point down the road, you buy the shares back, hopefully for a profit, and then you return the shares to your broker. So of course, if the stock is hard to borrow, your broker may not be able to find enough shares for you to borrow and fill your order. So therefore, going forward, I will always, always avoid hard to borrow stocks. And when I say that, sometimes stocks that are actually easy to borrow, most of the time, they can actually switch to become hard to borrow during certain kinds of market events. And so in order to best avoid that scenario, Definitely try to only trade stocks that have big names and that are super heavily traded, tens of millions of shares per day. So NVIDIA, like I just showed you, that's definitely a good one. This stock is almost always easy to borrow. Same thing with Apple or Snapchat, Uber, Google, whatever. Those big name companies that also have high implied volatility, those are the kinds of stocks that are the best to be trading with this kind of strategy. And also for most trading strategies as well. Liquidity is always important. But then also, if you ever have to short stock, you want to make sure the stocks are easy to borrow 100% of the time or very close to that. And then lastly here, my final learning lesson over these past five months was to play earnings trades very sparingly. I'm definitely not saying to completely avoid them because most of the time, earnings trades do offer very high implied volatility. They're great option selling opportunities, but they are pretty risky. If the actual earnings announcement is overly good or overly bad, the stock can move by a huge amount and potentially blow out your position. And that's definitely what happened to me in the third quarter earnings season. So again, if we come back to my spreadsheet here and let's take a look at the November spreadsheet, I vividly remember this trade here in Peloton. This was an earnings trade where I sold a short strangle, one 10 strike call option, 70 strike put option. The strikes were well beyond the actual current price of the stock before earnings. And then of course, after hours, when the earnings came out, this stock dropped by about 30% almost immediately. And that's why the final outcome of this trade was a loss of over $800. And like I said, this kind of thing happened to me multiple times in Peloton here, Snapchat, Bed Bath & Beyond, and a few others as well. For some reason, especially in the quarter three earnings season, there were just a lot of really outsized moves. And that definitely does not happen most of the time. In fact, in August, this was actually a different earnings cycle that I played. 
In fact, a lot of these trades were actually earnings trades and all of them worked. So again, I'm not saying to totally avoid earnings because selling options around those events does work most of the time. But as I certainly learned over these past five months, it's only a good idea to trade them in very small quantities and also with very small risk involved. And so there you have it. Even after making a lot of mistakes these past couple months, which was the whole point of this testing period anyway to begin with, still coming out with an overall profit of over 5,600 bucks, which again puts me on pace for about a 27% return in one full year. I think that's pretty darn good because that not only beats the market on average, which is one of the things I'm trying to do here, but also this kind of trading strategy is pretty independent of what the market is doing. I don't care if stocks go up, if they go down, if they go sideways, because this strategy allows me to make money in all of those environments. The S&P 500 could be down by 20% next year and my portfolio could still be up by 25%. And so at this point, after these five months, I do feel very confident with what I'm doing here with this new strategy that I've been developing. I wouldn't say I have 100% of everything figured out with this strategy, but certainly a lot of it and definitely enough to where going forward, I'm gonna start trading the strategy for real with real money. So very soon here, probably next week, I'm going to spin up my live trading account once again, and we'll see what happens over the course of 2022. And so with that being said, that's going to conclude this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and please let me know your thoughts or if you have questions in the comment section below. And don't forget, if you wanna take some very in-depth classes on options trading or stock market investing, then check out my Skillshare courses. Links in the description of this video. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up, drop a comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I drop new videos every single week, and you don't want to miss out. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.